Okay, so now we're going to talk about the practice domain. And when I use the term practice, that's just saying the therapy side. How we as counseling psychologists, one of the things we do is we provide therapeutic services, whether to individuals, groups, organizations, couples, families, schools, whatever, but providing therapeutic services. Um, we call the practice domain, another word for it is the, the clinical side of things, the clinical domain, um, or counseling, or helping. These are all kind of synonyms to distinguish the research side from the practice or therapy side. So we're going to talk about the practice domain. Now, earlier on, I already talked about the three letters of rec you want to plan to get and how one of them is going to be from someone who's seen your interpersonal and your practice and helping skills side of your professional self. Uh, and I talked about how ideally that person would have a doctorate, but that can sometimes be difficult and it's more common for that person to have a master's degree, usually as a mental health professional. Um, but the more credentialed they are, the stronger that letter will be. Um, but now I'm going to talk about how to prepare that practice side of your CV and your experiences so that you will be a strong applicant. And this looks much different for bachelor's students than it does for master's students who have gone into a mental health therapy program because those who have been completing a master's and are applying to PhD will necessarily be getting some clinical experiences as a part of that PhD who will have the opportunity for supervised clinical work. Whereas for bachelor's students, because of that level, you're typically not in a position to get supervision and to provide supervised therapy. It's a lot harder to have substantive experiences. And also the bar will generally be lower for folks who are coming straight out of bachelors because people will know that you wouldn't have had an opportunity to provide bona fide therapy in a supervised context. So m much of my advice will be geared towards um, people who are coming straight out of bachelors, though I'll do an addendum on the end for some things for folks with master's degrees to consider when it comes to the clinical side. So first things first, you need to get involved in at least one experience where you are using helping skills. And when I say helping skills, synonyms for this are active listening skills, or therapy skills, or micro skills. These are all synonyms that basically get at the, the skills we draw upon when we're uh, helping somebody through a talk therapy sort of thing. So some typical settings that undergraduates wanting to get clinical-ish experience will go to are things like uh, if there's a career center on campus where they employ undergraduates as uh, assistants or career coaches or consultants or whatever their term is, uh, paraprofessionals, that can be a place where those students can uh, help people who are exploring uh, what majors they want to pursue or what careers they want to pursue or helping them with resumes or cover letters. So in that setting, uh, those students, those paraprofessionals will have the opportunity to practice listening to the client, giving advice, helping them think through things, using some of those basic therapy and helping skills. So a career center on campus is one possible place you might be able to get clinical-esque experience. Another popular place is a rape crisis center or sexual assault or domestic violence center. Sometimes these centers might employ students on campus. A lot of times you'll have uh, a shelter or domestic or sexual violence center in the community and they're all called different things, but if you talk with, usually uh, in your department, if you're in a psych department in particular, one of the faculty members will be a coordinator 
of these uh, independent therapy-esque experiences and so they will have a list of sites where you might be able to pursue experiences like this uh, and so they would be able to let you know uh, if there were like a domestic violence or sexual violence center. So this is another place where you might be able to help. Um, and sometimes these experiences are only open to uh, female identified students uh, because of the gendered component that can be a part of sexual violence. Sometimes uh, certain agencies are not interested in having men be the one who are uh, providing services to uh, the survivors who are using the service. Um, but you'll want to check that out. So um, one thing is a lot of times these prayer professionals can maybe be sitting and talking with people at the shelter. It might not be therapy per se, but it might be just giving them uh, a chance to talk about their experience and relate to somebody else. It might be uh, helping out with keeping the kid, their kids company or things like that, but uh, helping out at the shelter where maybe you're doing outreach uh, presentations in the community on behalf of the shelter, but just something where you're using your helping skills in that context could possibly be useful. Uh, so another possible setting is at the counseling center um, or the mental health center on campus. Sometimes they have uh, uh, paraprofessionals where maybe it's a substance abuse focus or a career focus or an outreach focus where you can join their team and uh, you can provide uh, counseling sort of experience, quasi counseling experiences to other students or do outreach presentations on drugs or relationship health or other sorts of mental health related topics. Um, so student involvement as a paraprofessional with counseling centers or university health centers might be another possible place. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters is another place where uh, you're paired up with a younger person and you're providing them some interpersonal contact and hanging out and some mentoring. Uh, that can be another place where you'd be able to demonstrate your skills in interacting and supporting another person. So those are some of the initial types of sites that come to mind and hopefully you can get a sense about what I'm talking about. Uh, and so the thing is just peruse the web, uh, the website of your school, look for agencies in the local community, and just look for opportunities where you for, uh, of, on a volunteer basis or perhaps some money, would be able to provide emotional support in some way or outreach on mental health issues or things related to health. Um, that is a sort of experience that might be a good fit. And some schools even have a, a parallel credit-bearing experience to a research assistantship where it's like a clinical assistantship or sometimes it's called a field placement. So you can sign up for field placement credit or clinical experience credit so that you can get course credit while you're doing this paraprofessional clinical-ish experience. And so again, to reiterate, regardless of the type of site you work at, the, the thing that you want to make sure it involves is that you are getting to use those transferable skills. You are getting to practice active listening skills. You're getting to practice empathizing with another person, perhaps giving advice, uh, supporting them, these sorts of skills in this interpersonal supportive way. Those are the types of things that you want to be using as a part of this experience because you're going to want your supervisor associated with that site to be able to talk about your use of those particular skills. Can you use them? Because these basic skills are the building blocks of what makes a good therapist. And so professors who are considering your graduate school application will want to hear from your letter writers, hey, do they seem to have a decent grasp on these basic skills? Do they have the potential? Do they have the raw material to be able to build on these basic skills by learning the bona fide therapy skills and the heavier clinical stuff? You know, can they be a natural empathetic therapist? Can they be a warm person? So 
that's that's what you want to have captured in that clinical experience. And again, I think as an as a someone applying to PhD programs out of a bachelor's program, you really only need I think one solid clinical related experience to show the reader that um, you have that good potential to be a good clinician. So I think I think it takes more to impress people on the, in the research domain than it takes to impress them in the clinical domain. So that's something you can keep in mind. Some people who know or think they want to be clinicians will do more than one clinical experience. They'll really load up on that side, which might be a good fit for them, but you just have to bear in mind that the more time you spend doing one thing, the less time you have to spend on other things. And so it follows that if you want to get into a PhD program, uh, it's going to be harder to demonstrate uh, your research acumen than it will be to demonstrate your clinical acumen, usually. So you'll want to you know, do enough so that you've had one solid clinical-ish experience and a letter from that, but then it may be better suited for you to pour the remaining time you have into building your research side, since that is the one where it's trickier to stand out and get bona fide experiences. So, just something to keep in mind regarding the division of labor. So I think that wraps up the, the much briefer uh, clinical domain part of the discussion. Maybe I'll think of some things later to add in on this, but I think that's it for now.